Hi there, and welcome to Live with Lon. We're so glad you're with us today. Today, we're going to be continuing in our series in Romans 9, 10, and 11, What About Israel? I can't think of a more cogent or important topic for us to be talking about today in world history. So, without further ado, what about Israel? Now, many of us remember our good friend Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof, don't you? Some of us do. He sang songs like, sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset, quickly go the years. Who do you think's voice is better, mine or Dennis? <laughs> and he sang songs like, tradition, tradition, the mama, the papa tradition. And then, of course, there was that great song, If I Were a Rich Man, Yabby Dabby 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 Doo. Remember that? You remember Tevya, don't you? Now, Tevya was a hardworking, fun loving, tender hearted Jewish man who lived in a little village in Russia called Anatemka. And all was going pretty well for our good friend Tevya until the word came down from Moscow that there was to be a little demonstration, as the police commissar called it, a pogrom. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that word, what it is is a burning, looting, violent rampage aimed at Jewish people. And so there was one. And suddenly the little village of Anatemkia became a raging inferno of hatred and violence and shattered dreams for Tevya and for his family, who then moved to Chicago. You remember that. Now, this was not an uncommon occurrence in Russia or in Eastern Europe in the 19th century. And I wish I could tell you that this kind of activity was limited to Russia and Eastern Europe, but it isn't. In fact, the Anti-Defamation League reports that the number of anti-Semitic incidents in the United States of America increased in 1988. They went up 18.5%. There was an increase in anti-Jewish vandalism and a 41% increase in assault on Jewish institutions and harassment of Jewish individuals. And so whether it's Russian pogroms or the Spanish Inquisition, whether it's Eastern European ghettos or the Ku Klux Klan, whether it was Hitler and the Nazis or even anti-Semitic incidents in America, some of the worst treatment that Jewish people have ever gotten since the time of Christ has come in ostensibly Christian nations and has come from ostensibly Christian people. Now, how can that be? How can that be? Well, I, I believe a large part of the answer lies in our theology. You see, there are a number of people who really believe that they have sort of a quasi-theological basis for treating Jewish people these way, this way. And their basis is this. These are the Christ killers. These are the people who rejected the Son of God. These are the people who turn their backs on God, and as a result, God has turned His back on them. God has rejected them, God has repudiated them, God has discarded them as His special people, and therefore, these forsaken by God people make a great scapegoat for any problem or any issue that comes along that you need a scapegoat for. Now, if a person only reads part of the New Testament, it's easy to see how they could come up with this kind of perspective because... In the New Testament, there are some very strong statements about the Jewish people's rejection of Jesus as their Messiah. As a matter of fact, we've been studying here in Romans chapter 10, and if you're not there already, you can turn there, Romans chapter 10. We've been studying this chapter, and as you know, if you've been with us, this chapter is all about explaining to us why so many Jewish people miss salvation and end up in hell. And what we've been told in this chapter by the Spirit of God is that the reason this happens is that so many Jewish people are determined to do it their way by their own human merit, by their own human works, by their own human effort, 
and they refuse to submit to doing it God's way by simply believing on Jesus as their Messiah and trusting Him and His blood to save them. We've been told in this chapter that the reason so many Jewish people miss salvation is because they were not ignorant of the issues, but they were obstinate when it came to the issues. Verse 16 of chapter 10 says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. The issue was disobedience. Verse 3 of chapter 10 tells us that the Jewish people would not submit themselves to God's way of righteousness. So it's not only disobedience, but it's rebellion. And the last verse of chapter 10 tells us that these are a disobedient and an obstinate people. Now, if that's all you read about the Jewish people in the Bible, it would be very easy to justify anti-Semitic feelings anti-Semitic activities, be very easy to do that. But that's only one side of the coin. And the purpose of Romans chapter 11, which we're going to dig into this morning, is to give us the other side of the coin. God wants to make it absolutely clear that He has not rejected the Jewish people. He has not repudiated the Jewish people. In spite of their rejection of Him, God has not rejected them back. Romans chapter 11 tells us about the continuing commitment of God to the Jewish people, both in the present and in the future. And the purpose of Romans 11 is to balance out for us and help us realize that in spite of the fact these people rejected their Messiah, that gives us no right to reject them, to treat them wrong, to mistreat and abuse them because God has not done that. And I don't believe anybody who understands Romans chapter 11 can ever endeavor, can ever enter into anti-Jewish activity with any kind of a theological or biblical basis. You can't do it. It's too bad more people down through history that called themselves Christians didn't read the whole New Testament instead of just one verse here or there and then form theological and practical opinions based on a verse or two and not the whole tenor of God. And so I want us to look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 is very long. It is very complicated. As a result, I'm not going to try to make this into a seminary class. We could. We've got a couple seminary professors here, and I'm sure they'd happily sit and listen. Most of you probably wouldn't. And so I'm not going to try to take every single verse and explain every single nuance and every single little piece of information. Uh, I've got commentaries. I'll be happy to lend you if you really want to dig in that deeply. But I don't think it's that important that we understand every tiny little nuance. That's for theologians and pastors. I think the main thing is that we as a church need to understand is what is God basically trying to say? What is God basically trying to tell us in, these, in this chapter? And that's what I want to communicate to you this morning. So we're going to kind of move around a little bit, and, and I hope you won't feel uncomfortable with that. Let me give you the three things I want to convince you of this morning. Number one, God has not rejected His people. Verses 1 to 6. God has not rejected His people. Number two, I want to convince you that they are, in this present age, the Jewish people are under the judgment of God. Verses 7 down through verse 20. And then I want to convince you third and finally that even though the Jewish people are under the judgment of God in this age, God still has a plan for the Jewish people, both individually and as a nation. God still has a plan for these people, verse 20 through the end of the chapter. Now let's, let's look at this and see if we can understand what God is really saying. In verse 1, the issue arises, since Israel has been disobedient, the last verse of chapter 10, since Israel has been obstinate, the last verse of chapter 10, since Israel has rejected their Messiah, the issue of verse 1 of chapter 11 is, has God rejected, cast away His people? Has God pushed them aside? Has God repudiated them? Has God thrust them away from Himself and turned His head and said, I don't want anything more to do with you people? Has that happened? And the answer that God gives in verse 1 is, God forbid. By no means perish the thought, 
May it never be. I don't know how God could say it any stronger. He's trying to say this is not the way it really is. People may think it is, but this is not the way it is. And as proof of that, the writer, the rabbi Saul, the apostle Paul, points to himself and his own salvation. He says in verse 1, For I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Paul's point is if God had cast the Jewish people away, if God had repudiated them completely, if God had turned his head and said, I don't want anything more to do with you people, what that would mean is no Jewish person would ever get saved. If God had rejected them like that, and Paul said, and I am saved. I am a full-blooded Jew. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a rabbi, and I got saved, which is proof positive God has not turned his back totally on his people. You might say, well, I know God had, didn't turn his back on those Jewish people who got saved before Jesus was crucified. But after the Jewish people crucified Jesus, maybe things changed. Folks, that won't work. Paul didn't get saved until after Jesus had been crucified. And the fact that he had gotten saved is proof positive God has not cast away his people. In fact, he goes on to point to Elijah and to the time of Elijah, and how Elijah in the, some of the worst time of apostasy and, and the worst time of rebellion in the nation of Israel, how Elijah complained to God and said, God, I'm the only person left that believes in you. And God said, don't you believe it? There are 7,000 just like you. Maybe they're hidden in caves, but they're still around. God, even in the worst times, has never rejected his people. And it's still true today that even in the worst of times of rebellion as a nation, there are still people that are getting saved out of the Jewish nation because God has not cast away his people. Verse 5 says, Even so then at this present time, there is still also a remnant, verse 6 says, that are getting saved not by their own works, but who are willing to get saved by faith the way God said. And folks, down through history, that's the way it's been. Ever since the time of Paul, it's never changed. There have been Jewish people getting saved. Maybe not a lot, but there have been. Not by their own works, but by faith in Jesus as the Messiah in every generation. And some of them have been very well known. For example, Felix Mendelssohn, the great composer, was Jewish. God has not cast away his people. And then there was Joseph Pulitzer, the great journalist who founded the Columbia University School of Journalism and also founded the prestigious Pulitzer Prize. He was Jewish, folks, and got saved. God has not cast away his people. And then there was Sarah Bernhardt, the great actress and a member of the French Foreign Legion. God has not cast away his people. She was Jewish. She got saved. And Al Kasha, the modern Oscar-winning composer. And down through history, many Jewish people have given their lives to Jesus and believed on him as the promised Messiah and been saved. And the point is that if God had utterly cast apart his people, if God had utterly repudiated and rejected his people, none of them would ever have been able to have gotten saved. And yet they have gotten saved. And they do today in spite of their unbelief as a people, in spite of their unbelief as a nation and their apostasy and their rejection of Christ, God has not rejected his people. He has not cast them away and he never will. That's the first thing I want you to understand. God has not cast away his people. And we dare not treat those people as though God had cast them away because he hasn't. Second, there is a problem, however. You say, well, didn't God do anything to them when they rejected their Messiah? I mean, God just kind of turned his head and said, oh, well, gee, reject your Messiah if you feel like it. It's okay. No big deal. No problem. No, that was not God's response. God may not have cast away his people, but that was not God's response. Second thing that we learn from this chapter is, and even though God has not cast away his people, God has judged his people for what they did. I want you to turn back to Matthew chapter 27. Keep a finger in Romans 11. We're coming back. But I want you to turn back to the first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 27. And I want to show you something. God has judged his people. 
for rejecting their Messiah. Here in Matthew 27, Pilate is trying to be a good politician. He's trying to weasel out of a difficult situation in some way that makes him look good. I guess that's the definition of a politician, isn't it? Weaseling out of situation so you look good. Well, I don't know. Y'all don't seem to find that funny, so I'll go on. Anyway, verse 15 tells that Pilate had a feast, and at this feast every year he would release whoever the people of Israel, whoever the Jewish people wanted, whatever prisoner they wanted released. It says, verse 15, Now at that feast the governor, Pilate, was accustomed to releasing unto the people a prisoner, whoever they wanted. And they had a notable prisoner named Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered unto Pilate, he said to them, Who do you want me to release to you? Do you want me to release Barabbas, or do you want me to release, release Jesus, who's called your Messiah? And I believe Pilate really thought they were going to ask for Jesus, and he was going to get out of a very ticklish situation. But, verse 20, the chief priests and the elders had persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and that they should ask for Jesus to be destroyed. Now, this was the Jewish multitude, and in spite of the fact that Pilate, I believe, was trying to dissuade them from rejecting Jesus, they would hear none of it. And the governor, verse 21, answered and said to them, which of these two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said, well, what do you want me to do with Jesus, who you call Messiah? And they said unto him, let him be crucified. And Pilate argues with them and said, well, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that there was nothing he could do, but that they were about to have a riot, he had water brought to him. You know the story. He washed his hands symbolically, and he said, I'm innocent of the blood of this righteous person. You take responsibility. You see to it. Now look at verse 25. And then they, the people, the Jewish people, the rabbis, the leaders, answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Now that was a very stupid statement. That was very stupid, very foolish, because God took them up on it. They said, we'll take the responsibility. All right, we'll take the responsibility. You let his blood and the responsibility for shedding his blood be on us and our children. Just killing. And God said, all right, that's the way it'll be. Very foolish. Now, I have a perspective on Jewish history. Maybe you don't share it. I'm sure most Jewish people wouldn't share it if they don't know Christ. But my understanding of the history of the Jewish people for the last 1,900 years is that their history has been one tragic example after another of God judging them for what they did, for rejecting their Messiah. Do you know that during the siege of Jerusalem in the late 60s by the Romans, that in order to encourage the Jews to give up the city, they took 500 Jewish prisoners a day and crucified them outside the city walls so all the people could see, and they did that every single day. In fact, Josephus, the historian, records that after a while there was no more room to even set crosses up. There were so many crosses with dead people hanging on them. And then when the city finally fell in 70 AD, the city was ransacked, the temple was destroyed, Many, many Jewish people were killed and scattered. They rose again in 132 A.D., and the Romans came this time. They knocked down every block and brick in the city. They salted it so that nothing would ever grow again, and they made it a capital offense, punished by death, for any Jew to step into the city limits of Jerusalem. Let his blood be on us and our children. And down through 1,900 years of history, the Jewish people have been spread all over the world. They've been locked in ghettos. They've been persecuted. They've, been, they've suffered. They've had heartache. They've been kicked around, pushed around, beat around. Let his blood be on us and our children. And even the Holocaust of Hitler's Germany, I know there would be many people who would disagree with me, 
But it is my opinion that that is all part of God judging his people. Let his blood be on us and our children. Now, I, don't get me wrong. I'm not condoning these things. I'm not saying I agree that these things should have been done. I deplore these things. But I don't have control over these things. God does. And God decided they were going to happen. I believe they're all part and parcel of God's judgment. And the worst part of all is what we're going to learn about right back in Romans 11. I want you to go back there. The worst part of the judgment of God is that God has not only judged them physically for what they did, but God has judged his people spiritually for what they did. Look with me at verse 7. It says, what then? Israel didn't obtain that which it sought for. That is, it didn't obtain righteousness with God and relationship with God. The election got it. The remnant got it. There was a small group that got it, but the rest missed it. Why? Because verse 7 says they were blinded. Look at verse 8. According as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, the spirit of stupor, the spirit of deep sleep, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear. In fact, if you skip on down to verse 25, it'll tell you down there that God doesn't want us to be ignorant that blindness has happened to Israel. Now, folks, every sinner is blind to the truth of God. Every sinner. Every sinner comes into the world, Ephesians 2, 1 says, dead to God unresponsive to God, unresponsive to the truth of God. Ephesians 4.18 says that every sinner is darkened or blinded in his or her understanding. And so whenever you go out to present the gospel to anybody, you're dealing with a certain natural fleshly blindness to the things of the gospel that God has got to remove. But what we are being told here is that not only do Israelites, not only does the Jewish nation have that natural, normal blindness that every sinner has, but that in a very special way, God has laid upon them a double whammy. God has given them a spiritual blindness beyond what is normal as a judgment for what they did in rejecting their Messiah. God has made them spiritually harder than Gentiles. God has made them spiritually more numb to the gospel than Gentiles. God has made Jewish people spiritually more dull and more callous and more insensitive to the truths of God than the average Gentile. When it comes to responding to the gospel, it's like Jewish people are under spiritual anesthesia. And whereas when it comes to education and finances and business and entrepreneurial skills, these people are alive and vigorous, they have vitality and they have energy, you know that. Man, when it comes to the things of Christ and to the gospel, it's like these people are in a coma. Their reflexes just aren't working well spiritually. Now I can identify with that. It's not very often I have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I try to plan my life so that doesn't happen. But occasionally, I have to get up that early. Now, I, I'm not good at 5 o'clock in the morning, folks. In fact, not too long ago, I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning and was feeling my way to the bathroom, and, and I felt what I thought was the doorpost with the door right in front of me, but what I actually had was the doorpost with the door over here. And so I proceeded to walk square into the wall. You ever try to go, ah, without waking anybody up at 5 o'clock in the morning? You ever hit something that you didn't know was coming? I, I mean, I can't explain to you how I felt. And you just shake your head, you're, and you go, what is, where am I? That's how I am at 5 o'clock in the morning. I drive in suspended animation. I just put it in drive and just hope nothing gets in front of me. I feel like George Burns who says when he wakes up, he reads the obituaries, and if his name's not in it, then he shaves. <laughs> And that's how I feel at 5 o'clock in the morning. And my reflexes just don't work well. Some of you can identify with that. Now, at 9 o'clock in the morning, my reflexes work fine. I normally don't walk into doors at 9 in the morning. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, my reflexes are working well, but not at 5 in the morning. It's like I'm almost comatose. And this is what God is saying about his people. Do you understand? He's saying when you present the gospel to somebody that's a Gentile, 
and you pray for them and you work with them, their reflexes will probably be like people's at 9 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But when you're trying to present Christ to a Jewish person, they've got reflexes like it's 5 a.m. And so God has not rejected His people, but He has judged them and He has hardened them with a supernatural blindness to the gospel and that is why it is so hard to reach a Jewish person because you're not just dealing with the normal amount of fleshly resistance and blindness that every sinner has to the gospel, but you're also dealing with this judicial blindness representing the supernatural judgment of God that He has laid upon that whole race. And for a Jewish person to come to know Christ, folks, it takes a special act of the grace of God. And normally on the human level, it takes one bulldog of a witnesser and one bulldog of a prayer warrior to see a Jewish person come to know Christ. I've told you about my maid, my black lady, who prayed for me for 21 years. I guarantee you none of her Gentile friends did she ever have to pray 21 years for. But I needed 21 years because I'm Jewish. And whether I like it or not, I have to live with that statement. Let His blood be on us and our children. Now, there's one third thing that God tells us, third and final. It's not hopeless, folks, because one of these days, God's going to lift that blindness. That's exciting. You see, it's, not, it's a temporary blindness. It's not a total blindness. It's not forever. God's going to lift it one day. God still has a plan for His people, and I want to show you that. It's true. It's true that God hasn't rejected His people, and it's true that He's judged them, but listen, it's only temporary. Look down with me, chapter 11. First, I want to show you that God sometimes lifts that blindness for individuals. It says here, verse 23, And if they also, Jewish people, abide not still in unbelief, they shall be grafted back into the tree, for God is able to graft them back in. Now, although I'm not going to take the time to go through it all, if you read, you will find that the imagery that's being used is that of an olive tree. And the trunk of the olive tree represents the promises of God and the blessings of God given not to the Gentiles, but given to the Jews. And God says, because the Jewish people would not believe me, I went through lopping off and breaking off branches, individual Jewish people, and ripping them off from the trunk, ripping them off from the blessing and the promises of God, ripping them off from salvation because they would not believe me. And then for you Gentiles who were willing to believe, I came in and I stuck you guys on it. So you got into their good thing. It's not your good thing. It's their good thing that you got in on. But God says, any one of those Jew Jewish branches that I ripped off and threw aside that's willing to trust me and believe me for those Jewish people that I do a special work of grace in and they do trust Christ, God says I take them and I stick them right back in that tree right back into the blessing of God, right back into the promises of God, right back into Abraham's salvation and everybody coming after him, that same salvation. Normally, when you rip a branch off a tree and throw it aside, it's dead. The sap dies up. You can't put it back into the trunk again. But it says here, God is able to graft them back in. God's able to take dead branches and give them life and put them back in. And so, folks, don't you ever think that even though the Jewish people are under the judgment of God, don't you ever think that there aren't Jewish people out there that God's not willing to give life to and graft them back in? He is. Individually, God has a future for every Jewish person that's willing to trust Him. And God also has a future for the nation. One of these days, He's going to lift that blindness, and all of a sudden, there are literally going to be millions of Jews who suddenly understand what they did. There are going to be millions of Jews who suddenly understand they rejected their Messiah. There are going to be millions of Jews who understand that Jesus really was who He said He was, and they're going to receive Him. You say, how do you know that? Look with me, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you be ignorant of this mystery, lest that you should be wise or conceited in your own thinking towards Israel. That blindness in part has happened to Israel. It's not total blindness because Jews are still getting saved, but it's blindness in part. Now, there's a very important word that comes next, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until. Aha! 
What that means is it's not permanent. That it's only happened until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Until the times of the Gentiles are over. You say, what are that? Come next week and I'll explain it to you. We're going to talk all about prophetic events and the future of Israel next week. And then it says, verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved. Folks, there's coming a day when you are going to see on this earth an entire Jewish nation that all believes in Jesus. You say, I can't believe that. Well, you better believe it because it's going to happen. God says it's going to happen. And as we approach the end of this age, as we approach the return of Jesus Christ, we are going to see more and more Jewish people coming to Christ, believing in Jesus, accepting Him as their Messiah, as God begins to set the stage for the day when He will lift the blindness totally and all Israel's going to get saved. What a day that's going to be. Because it says in verse 12, that if Israel's blindness resulted in the riches for the whole world, the gospel being offered to the whole world, what in the world is going to happen when they come into fullness? And in verse 15 it says, if their casting away resulted in the reconciling of millions of Gentiles, what in the world is it going to be when they come back except life from the dead? That's going to be a day, folks. You better believe it. And so let's summarize and say this. God has not repudiated His people. God has judged them for their rejection of their Messiah. And that judgment includes two things. Number one, as a nation, they have been displaced from being God's favored nation in this age. But it's only temporary. They're coming back into favored nation status. They're going to be the head of the millennial kingdom. Better believe it. It's going to happen. And number two, God has judged them by putting blindness on them spiritually above and beyond what the rest of the world has to deal with in terms of blindness. But it's only partial because in every age there have still been Jewish people who've seen through the blindness by the grace of God and been saved. And we as the church cannot treat Jewish people with contempt. We cannot treat them with condemnation. We must not treat them that way because that's not how God treats them. We need to be careful, folks. We need to be careful that we see people, all people, Jewish people, the way God sees them. Now, I want to do one more thing before I close here, and that is I want to encourage your heart a little bit. Because I believe that Israel is God's timetable for the universe. I believe that Israel is God's timepiece for the return of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus said, you know, you'll see lots of signs. There'll be earthquakes. But there have always been a lot of earthquakes. I mean, it's hard to really go on that one. And he said you'd hear of wars and rumors of wars, but there have been wars all the time, and who knows how to, how, how to count them up and how to do that. And there'll be famine and all kinds of other things, but there have always been famine. And God also said one other thing. He said that his people, Israel, were like a fig, were like a fig tree. And when you see that fig tree beginning to bear leaves, you know the fruit can't be far behind. And it was in that context that Jesus said, and he, and I'm quoting him, he said, Now when you see these things, when you see the fig tree start to sprout leaves and you know the fruit's coming, when you see that, then he said, Look up and lift up your head because your redemption is right around the corner. I'm just about ready to come back. And I want to tell you something, folks. We are li living in a time where we are seeing what wise men and prophets have desired to see and they never saw. We are living in a day when we are seeing things that people spent years praying for and died and never saw. And men and women spent their lives suffering and giving up and sacrificing to try to see happen and they never saw it. We are living in a day in which God the Spirit is doing something among Jewish people such as the world has never seen since the days of Christ. Let me tell you just a little about it because if that's really true... We need to be looking up, not down. Something's right around the corner. And that is Jesus is coming back. Listen a second. The first Jews arrived in America in September 1654. They came to New Amsterdam. Our good friend Peter Stuyvesant was the head of the colony. Y'all remember him from American history. Our good friend Peter Stuyvesant protested strongly against having any Jews in his colony. He called them a deceitful race who professed an abominable religion and he didn't want them. Peter Stuyvesant. 
And that was the way most of the world felt about the Jewish people. And the real change came with the rise of Puritanism in America. Because the Puritans, as they read the Bible, they began to understand that God still had a purpose for the Jewish people, that He wasn't done with them yet. And they began to teach that and preach that. And really the beginning of what we think of as modern Jewish missionary work began with the Puritans. It, they really began with Cotton Mather. Many of you may know that name, the great Puritan preacher. Cotton Mather, who also, by the way, was a founder of Yale University. He'd roll over in his grave today. But anyway, he was. Cotton Mather repeatedly prayed for God's beloved people. And he would spend hours on his knees beseeching God for a mighty revival to break out among the Hebrew people in America. He died and he never saw it. His son increased Mather was also intensely interested in Jewish evangelism. By the way, Increase Mather was the president of Harvard University. He'd roll over in his grave too. And this man would spend every time, every day in his weekly prayer time, he would carve out a section of his prayer time every day and every week to pray for revival to break out among the Jewish people because these people knew that when that happened, the return of Christ was right around the corner. They both died. They never saw it. Jewish immigration into America went up dramatically in the mid-1800s, as many of you know. And there was a number of Jewish missions who began, that began during the mid-1800s. These were a people who lived in obscurity. They died in obscurity. If I told you what their names were, you've never heard of them. And they worked and they prayed and they sacrificed to see widespread revival come to the Jewish community. And they died and they never saw it. And entering into the 20th century, there had been a lot of work and not many results. In the late 19th century, the American Board of Missions to the Jews, the ABMJ, began by a man named Leopold Cohen. He was a rabbi, an Orthodox rabbi that had been led to Christ. And he began the American Board of Missions to the Jews. In my opinion, the flagship Jewish missions organization in the world. And since the late 19th century, for almost 100 years now, that mission has been reaching out to Jewish people. I had the great privilege of being at a conference uh, last spring when Dr. Daniel Fuchs, who was the president, the past president of the American Board of Missions, spoke. He'd been the, involved in Jewish missions for over 50 years, this man. And he read a paper it was a scholarly paper. It was a scholarly conference. It was the Luzerne Consultation for Jewish Evangelism. There was about 40 of us there, all Jewish believers for the most part. And he had a scholarly paper entitled The History of Jewish Missions in America. Now, I don't really get off on scholarly papers. You know what I'm saying? I'd much rather watch the Redskins. But I was here, so I, I went and listened. And I didn't really know this man very well. I mean, I just went. And, and I don't normally cry at scholarly papers. I mean, unless it's from boredom, you know. <laughs> but by the time this man was through, he had given me such a perspective that I never had before that I found myself just sitting there, tears just rolling down my face. It was one of the most moving experiences I've ever had. Let me tell you why. This man went back and talked about Cotton Mather and Increase Mather and names of people I had never heard of in Jewish evangelism and talked about how these people sacrificed, how they ate beans and how they didn't have meat and how their children only had one change of clothes so they'd wash the kids' clothes when they came home and have them clean and ready to go back to school the next morning because these people were committed to seeing revival break out in the Jewish community. And they spent their whole lives and died in obscurity. And he said, and I quote, when I began with the American Board of Missions in 1937, I believe that I knew every Jewish Christian in the United States and Canada. And that's incredible. There couldn't have been that many if this man could have known them all. He said there were so few. The Jewish leaders mostly ignored us or scorned us. To most of them, Jewish missions were either non-existent or so ineffective that they weren't worth worrying about. One rabbi told me that the Jewish people enjoyed our antics. We were so ineffective. And then Dr. Fuchs went on to tell about how his family went without and sacrificed to serve 
in the cause of seeing Jewish evangelism advanced and how he would stand out on the streets of Brighton Beach and Brooklyn and Coney Island and give out tracts and be spit on and be beat up and be pushed around and how they didn't have much and how he would pray and pray and pray and it just looked like nothing was happening. And how he figured he was going to go to his grave like Increase Mather and like Cotton Mather and like many of these other people and he was never going to see it happen. And then he said... The 60s came. He said, and old people like me, we thought the whole world was falling apart. People marching in the streets, anti-war demonstrations, people burning the American flag. He said, but out of the 60s came a movement of the Spirit of God among Jewish people such as the world has never seen since the time of Christ. He said, the Jesus people who came out of the late 60s and early 70s, he said, the number of them that were Jewish was incredible, and God, it's just like God just, God just snapped a switch. And all of a sudden, Jewish people started getting saved, and it hasn't stopped since. He, he said, now you sitting here in the room, he said, I'm just curious. How many of you got saved, all Jewish people now, between the window of 1970 and 1973? Raise your hand. Well, I raised my hand because that's when I got saved. Do you know there was about... 40 to 60 percent of us that raised our hands in that meeting who got saved in that little window of those three years? Folks, the next time you meet a Jewish person that's saved, ask them when they got saved. You, you won't believe how many of them got saved in the three years that began the 70s. The Spirit of God began to do something, and it hasn't stopped. Fuchs went on to say what a difference it is today. Wherever I go, there are Jewish Christians. The rabbis no longer ignore us. They've organized a committee on the cults and missionaries to fight us. They attend our meetings. They read everything we publish. They hold seminars on how to answer the missionaries. More Jews are being won to the Lord Jesus Christ today, Fuchs said, than at any time since the days of the apostles. There are more Jewish believers alive today. Do you realize this, my dear friends? There are more Jewish believers alive today than at any time since the days that Paul and John and, and even Jesus Jesus himself walked on the face of the earth. There are more believers in Israel today than at any time since the time that Israel, Jerusalem, was sacked by the Romans and the people were spread all over the world. In 1981, we believe there was somewhere between 300 and 600 Israeli believers. That's it, total. And today we believe there is somewhere between four and 8,000 in six short years that live in Israel and are believers. There are congregations there that meet in every major city. There is a task force which each congregation has sent a representative to it. There is a task force for evangelism. These people are beginning to use the media. They're beginning to go out in the streets and hand out tracts in Israel. Now you say, well, but four to 6,000 doesn't sound like that many believers, but in a country of only 3 million people, and to have grown from 300 to more than 6,000 in six years, there's a revival going on there, folks. And so I want to say to you, as Jesus said, he said, truly, truly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things that you see, and they didn't see them. But blessed are your eyes because you see. And folks, I want to say to you, blessed are your eyes because you see things that for 1,900 years Christians had to take by faith. You are seeing things that for 1,900 years nobody could even imagine could ever happen. You are seeing things that many godly men prayed for much more than you've ever prayed for and went to their graves and never saw. And God has given your eyes the privilege of seeing it happen right in front of your face. And Daniel Fuchs, at the end of his little paper, looked up. I'll never forget it. Tears rolling down his face. Tears rolling down my face. And he said, I want to tell you something to you. He said, I'm 76 years old. I've been in Jewish work 50 years. The only goal I ever had was to see what I see today. And he said, if God takes me to my grave tomorrow, I can lay down and lie in peace. Thanking God, he let me see. Thanking God he let me see. But so many other people went to their graves and never got to see. He died two weeks later, suddenly, of heart failure. 
And I tell you, so many times I've thanked God that he didn't die before I got a chance to hear this man. Because he gave me a whole new perspective on what's happening. Jesus said, when you see the tree put out leaves, get ready, because the fruit's coming. And my dear friends, in light of what's happening today and among the Jewish people, I want to say to you, Jesus said, when these things become to pass, begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your head, for your redemption draws near. Say, when is Jesus coming back? I don't know. What day is he coming? I don't know. What time of year will it be? I don't know. Will it be in 89? <clears throat> I don't know. But I'll tell you this. Jesus said it would be soon when we saw these things start to happen. And I declare to you, there's going to be some of us here, I believe, you're going to be sitting at your desk one day at school and all of a sudden you're going to hear something that sounds weird. It doesn't sound quite like a siren, but it sounds sort of like a siren. And you say, what in the world is that? And suddenly you just start floating. You say, but I haven't finished my science yet. Doesn't matter. You're gone. Science won't make any difference in heaven. Isn't that great, guys? You're not going to have to do science in heaven. No algebra in heaven. Amen? Yeah, that's right. Or you'll be sitting there feeding the children at the breakfast table, and all of a sudden you'll hear this weird sound, and up you go. Or you'll be down on 15th Street getting off the metro and on the way to work, and all of a sudden everybody else on the ground, you're just kind of walking up. People are going to look at you, just smile and wave, because you're gone. It's going to happen one day soon, and I believe with all my heart there are some of us in this room who are going to be part, not of dying and going to be with Christ, but there are some of us in this room, I believe with all my heart, who are going to be alive on the day he comes back, because it really is not going to be long. And so what kind of problems you got? You got problems? Yeah. <laughs> keep your eyes on the return of Christ, you don't have any problems. They're going to be over soon. There's no diapers in heaven. Babies don't get up for feeding in the middle of the night in heaven. There's no boss telling you you've got to get some paper done or you've got to get some project done in heaven. So take it easy, folks. Kind of Just kind of mellow out and learn to look at all of your circumstances in light of the fact that it's not going to be long before you're leaving. One glad morning you're gonna fly away and it's not gonna be long so when your boss gives you a hard way to go just kind of smile at him and go I'm gonna fly away <laughs> he may want to commit you but doesn't matter whether he understands you may not want to say it out loud if you value your job but just say it to yourself I'm gonna fly away go ahead do anything you want I'm flying away soon let me have it Smile at that little dirty diaper and say, I'm going to fly away. I'm leaving. It's an exciting thing to think about Jesus coming back for us. And I declare to you, in light of what we see happening with the Jewish people, it's not going to be long. So look up. That's what Jesus said, didn't he? He said, look up. Don't look down. Look up. Lift up your head. Because it's coming soon. God bless you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the privilege of opening your word this morning. Thank you for the encouragement of your word, not only teaching us about your people and what you have in store for them, but even better, God, for those of us who know Christ, teaching us that you're coming soon. And Lord, we can deal with almost anything if we know you're coming soon. Lord, we can put up with almost any heartache if we know you're coming soon. Lord, we can deal with almost any issue and pressure and stress in our life if we know you're coming soon. Father, we can even deal with tragedy and heartache if we know you're coming soon. And so, Lord, thank you that when the tree sprouts leaves, we know the fruit's not far behind. Thank you for letting us live in the day where our eyes have seen what many prophets and righteous men desired to see, and they didn't get to see it, but we have. And, Lord, help us look up. Help us lift up our heads, because we know your coming is just around the corner. May you find us faithful when you arrive. And Lord, I pray you would cause people out there that don't know you today to grasp the issues and understand how important it is to give their life to you today, because you might come tonight. We look forward to that day, dear God. Encourage our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I hope you enjoyed our treatment of the Word of God today. I hope it was challenging, and I hope the exposition of the Scripture brought joy to your heart. And we're going to continue until we finish up Romans 11, and then we're going to go back to our series in the Gospels and finish that up. So, thank you for being with us today to study the Word of God. God bless you, and how sweet it is.